And it looks like we are live. There we go. <clears throat> awesome. Let's post this link in the chat. Or actually, I'll let someone else do it. I don't know how to fucking do it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, his uh, Jason Day uh, course history didn't seem to be too much of an issue at um, at the players, where it's you know probably just as bad as it is here. For one of those early comments. Yeah, exactly. Um, not too worried about course history with Jason Day at this point, to be honest. Yeah. Um, Ask that. You see, it, I mean, the top three this week is just. Uh, it's uh, it's kind of I don't want to say it's a disaster, but it's it it's tough to differentiate. I mean, there's this case that you could make for all three, and I mean, we could probably sit here and just debate those three players all night if we wanted to. But um, you know, I I think for me personally, um, I don't think I'm gonna try and make like super stacks with with two or three of them. I, I we can't make a stack with three of them this week, but you could make a stack with two of them. But uh, I think I'm just going to jump on, on one and uh, and maybe try and center a few lineups around them. And that's pretty much it. I, I think there's a lot of balance in this field. And I know it, it, it you know if, if, if Rory wins or, or Jason Day wins going away or something and you don't have them, it sucks. But, you know, you got to make a choice at some point. So is uh, is any one of those three guys, like, sticking out specifically for you? Or is it is it kind of the same story? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's... No one in particular. I mean, what I've seen early is a lot of guys just below there where I feel like I'm going to be able to get three of them instead of maybe just one of one of the top guys and mix it up. I mean, I think there's a lot of love uh, to be given right below them. I mean, I, I, you can't argue against any one of them. So, yeah. you know, I almost feel like you, you might get the most by just, you know, like how they have those bets where it's like nine of the field. Like it's kind of like, just go with all the field and not even touch the three, and then hopefully none of them, you know, you know, factor. But you know, one of them, if not two of them, are going to be up there. So it's kind of just like flipping a three-sided coin. And it's a good point for GPPs because even if one of them finishes like fourth or something, and they have a big week, doesn't mean you necessarily have to have them in the field. I know last year at this tournament, I had a huge GPP finish. I think I was like third in in one. It was like a six thousand man field, and I didn't have speed on my lineup, and he was third, and he had a huge, huge week, but I didn't have him on there, so uh, you can win big GPPs without these guys, if they don't win, obviously, if they win, then you probably need them on your team, but, yeah. but uh, you know, uh, it's probably even money that one of them don't win. I think this is a tough spot for the three of them, to be honest. I think, I think A, it's hard to win two, two, two weeks in a row. I think, B, everyone is pointing to the fact that these three guys are coming in on wins and expecting them to, to perform, and this isn't a major championship. It's not like they're peaking for this week. So I, I'm, I'm probably going to fade them, to be honest, in my GPPs. And uh, in a cash game, I might try and fill one on. But uh, I think balance is, is the way to go this week for me personally. I don't know. <laughs> it's yeah, I mean, tough. No, I totally, uh, totally agree uh, with that. And I got, we got Bobby back in there, of course. How we doing, okay. Oh, hey, how's it going? What are your thoughts on these three guys? I miss the open. I'm guessing you're talking about the three top price players. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, in in looking at it, Jenna, uh, and but um, I think uh, I think both Steve and you hit it hit, hit it right hit the nail right in the head in terms of, you know, I don't think you could go wrong with either one of the three, and, and um, I mean if. Like, like you said, Jeff, if one of them happens to win you don't have those guys in your roster, then you're not going to be looking to make a big cash, one of those big GPP plays. But, you know, I think uh, for this week, depending on, I think the ownership will probably be fairly level amongst the three of them. All of them are coming, off, uh, coming in really, really hot with Rory's win at the Irish Open a few weeks back. Um, so I think it's going to, I don't think, the, I don't unless one goes three win, I don't think either one of them is going to make your big week for you. So it's obviously going to, fall on the guys below them. So uh, it's hard for me to really uh, favor one over the other. I'd probably point towards McRoy a bit just because I think he might be a little bit lesser owned than the other two. Um, maybe Day's course history, which I think is a stupid narrative, might push people off into, but, you know, he's been playing the best golf. He's the best golfer in the world right now, so I don't think it should. 
So uh, that's my uh, take on the top three. Yeah, yeah. I think I think ownership wise, Spieth will be the highest owned, um, mm-hmm. just because he's Spieth. He's coming off the win, and and I don't know. Maybe he is the best suited for this course in this week. But uh, I think Day is the guy who people should be getting on. That's the guy I would I would choose of those three. He's he's the best player in the world. I mean, yeah, he, I mean, and, I, yeah. it, and I know it's the big three, but it's like it, he's he's better than them. Like he just is right now. He's he's the most dominant player in the world to me. Put it this way, he's got the ball striking that Speed doesn't have, and he does. He's in the same class of uh, scrambling and around the green right now too. So yeah, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard to fit, uh, put Speed over Day uh, right at this moment. Yeah, so I guess that's my I guess that'd be my one advice for for the top three guys. If you are going to go on one of them, I, I would get on Jason Day. I, I just think you can never go wrong with him. I mean, may, maybe it doesn't happen this week. Maybe he just has one of those off weeks. But at this point, he's almost at a 50% strike rate. So uh, you can't beat that. What are, you, what are your thoughts on you think uh, the strategy of fading all top three of them? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's actually more the route I'm going to go. Like uh, like I said at the top, I'm not going to make, like, super stack, like, stars and scrubs. I'm not going to fit, like, speed and day in. I'll probably make some lineups with like just Day or like maybe just Spieth or just McElroy and then go there. But I think I'm leaning more towards just going balanced and and, and trying to hit more of the optimal lineup this week. Uh, I know it kind of worked for me last year, but um, you know Spieth fade, speed fading Spieth here. But um, I just feel like with the quality of field that you're getting here, it, it lends itself more to that. So yeah, yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just I, I just like all those guys and the value you get underneath this week in weeks like this, and then and then Day probably end up winning by five. But, you know, I, I still think it's the right way to go. I don't know. So. No, I mean, I'm with you for the balance approach because, I mean, you could, you could on paper, construct lineups where, you know, all, every golfer of the six guys on your roster has a legitimate shot of cracking a top ten where well, you don't really see that in your, uh, in, in your, in your tournaments uh, typically. So... Uh, I think I'm I think I'm definitely leaning towards a more balanced approach this week. I might um, mix in a few uh, lineups with those t- one of those top three guys, but I just think there's too much value underneath that. And, and Kuchar, I know he's going to be high on, and Reed, who I love for this course this week too. Where you can really build some very strong six uh, deep, like very deep uh, six player lineups with those two guys below the top tier range. Yeah. So let's uh, let's. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Steve. No, go ahead. I was just going to kind of echo that. I mean, I got. You know, I was texting Bobby before we got on here. I just I, I see a lot of myself on the cash side going, you know, like a, a Kucher, Schwartzel, DJ, or, you know, Kucher, Schwartzel, um, Reed for a lot of those cash. I mean, those are three guys that, you know, you wouldn't be surprised if, if you saw them finish one, two, three, and then you got a decent amount of money left to round out that lineup. I mean, I think you're probably, like you're saying, as long as the, the field doesn't get lapped on those top three, you really put yourself in a good position for a, an optimal um balanced lineup. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There, There is a ton of value out there, so we should probably start talking about it, even though, like I said, uh, I'm still worried about these these three guys. But uh, what um, if you're not going to start your lineup with one of those big three, who are you starting with? Like uh, you mentioned Kucha for cash games. I mean, I don't even think we have to talk about him too much. He's just such a no-brainer play at this point. When he gets on these types of roles, he's – it's like auto top ten, especially on courses he likes. He likes Jack Nicholas courses. He likes Pete Dye courses. This is a Jack Nicholas course. So, I mean, uh, eight straight cuts here. His worst finish in, the, in those eight is 26. The average of 10.0 uh, finish position at this course. I mean, it's. You know, I was gonna throw in Reed for my one and done just because I thought it was a little sneakier play, but uh, this is no reason not to go with Kuchar here. It's. Uh, yeah. No better spot for a one and done. I think. I, I agree. I mean, I think you're guaranteed a top ten here, and I don't say that very often. But I just, I just, Matt Kuchar, when he get like he, when he gets playing like this, he just, he, he can maintain it for four or five weeks, and that's what he's doing now. So, um, yeah, I wouldn't be shocked if if Kuchar won this week either. Uh, I, I do like um, Ricky Fowler for GPPs this week personally. Uh, I think this is. The pressure is kind of off, Ricky. Like everyone's talking about the top three guys. He's got a second place here from 2010. He was actually third going into the final round the year Kucher won here, or maybe it wasn't the year Kucher won. I don't know. It was. It was like I think it was 2012. And then he shot like 84 in the last round. Uh, just the all-around stats on him make him look like one of the best plays to me, fit for this course-wise too. So. Um, you know, you just never know when Ricky's going to put it all together. But uh, I feel like 
with all the focus on those other three guys, he's just going to go out there and play golf this week. And uh, it's a bit of a narrative issue there, but uh, for GPPs, I can get behind it. And I just, I just like the idea of Ricky Fowler because we know he can beat fields like this. I mean, he won the Deutsche Bank last year. He won the players. It's another elite field. Uh, I feel like he gets up for these ones. So. Yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, I think Bobby would... You know, I'll probably agree just the location of where he is. You know, I haven't looked into much of his, uh, his you know, round-by-round round numbers, things like that, but if you just look where he's positioned, if you, you know, if you take that jump off of the top three, you know, you go right into Matsuyama, Fowler, DJ, you look at the DJ trend, you look at the Matsuyama chalk, you look at Kucha right below, you know, it's going to be hard for people to spend the money on Fowler who hasn't looked uh, or at least has finished as exciting as people has hoped, you know, with those number of the, the prices. I mean, I could see Fowler easily being the lowest owned guy above, you know, 9,500. I mean, maybe, yeah, uh, right? Absolutely, and he's always popular. So uh, I feel like this might be like the non-chalk Ricky week, which is which is awesome because, uh, yeah, I mean, he's, he's, um, he's 700 more than Bubba too. So, I mean, if people want a GPP play, they might just go, to Baba or Reed, right, or, or, or Phil Mickelson even. So uh, he's got the price working against him. He's got the two the two top sort of chalky players in between them. Like it's it's a good week to get on Ricky for GPPs. I think I I think you might see him at 15% or something, maybe even lower. Because and that's really low for Ricky because he's always even when he's like not favored, he seems to have 20% ownership. So uh, I, I like him this week. I like him for a fit for this course too. I mean. Like I said, it's always a little sketchy, but uh, he's been showing up more than people realize this year. Hasn't quite crossed the finish line yet, but... Uh... I mean, Jeff, I think you said it perfectly. Anytime you can get Ricky uh, not as chalk, then I am buying I am buying lots of shares of him this week. <laughs> but that's all you got to really tell me. I mean, he's been, he's been striking the ball great all year. He missed a cut at the players. Uh, still, I think he still struck the ball very well. They had like three, like two, like I, I believe it was two uh, strokes gained to the green. He struck the ball very, very well at the uh, Wells Fargo. So, you know, yeah. it's, the, the good thing about Ricky uh, owners this week is you got, you know, the miscut at the Masters narrative and the miscut at the players narrative. So you got the two biggest tournaments of the year so far. He miscut. You got a, a, a highly acclaimed, well recognized field. Um, with the three big guys on top, I think for once, and this might be the best opportunity, buying opportunity to get for Ricky all year, you have a shot at getting a guy with nearly as high of a ceiling as anybody in this tournament at a depressed ownership, and I think that's the makings of a great, great GPP play this week. If you look at the, uh, the ownership uh, you know, for Fowler uh, across the, you know, since, since the shell, you know, the average across all of them, 28%, 22.5, 22.6, 17.8, 16.0. .0. You know, I don't think he cracks 15. I mean, I imagine he's going to be in like the 12 to 14 range. Yeah. The that's only, pretty, that's the only awesome. thing that always scare me with Ricky, though, especially in the lower price GPP tournaments, is just the name uh, attached to him, which will, will which will naturally drive his ownership levels a little bit more than you would naturally uh, project. But yeah. I still, I still think he's going to be. A lot less chalky than he normally is, and I'm I'm definitely uh, gonna get some shares on him. Oh, and then uh, I think I saw one of those chats come up. I just didn't get the comment on it. Um, yeah, about uh, actually Bobby had mentioned that uh, the, the speed percentage tends to be low when Rory's playing. Um, they both tend to be low, what it is, right? But it's what, Bobby with the the difference between Heath and Rory when they play together. Um, that's the only time that. One of them uh, drops down. What is that again? Yeah, I, you know, I don't have uh, I don't have those numbers right in front, but I did an analysis before, right before the Masters, and if you look back, I think a great example was at Doral. Um, both of their ownership percentages are depressed mightily when they are uh, in the same tournaments together, and and you know, I look we looked at all the tournaments that they that they played together, and they, and they weren't. Met, uh, matched up, in the, not matched up, but they weren't playing in the same tournaments, and I, it was pretty significant. I, I mean, take it for what it is, uh, but I, you know what, it, just, it could be that maybe the ownership tends to spread more evenly amongst the two of them, or, uh, or you know, but, but in the tournaments that the two have been together, you have seen depressed ownership levels, so you add day to the top of the mix. That's why I think you, when, when you're talking about the top three, at the, I, I don't think you go wrong with either one of them if that's going to be your play because I think the ownership is going to be fairly spread across the three. It's just a matter of which one, if any, decide, decides to take it down. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
You guys touching anyone else uh, up in that range? I mean, I know I mentioned Bubba. I, I do think Bubba's kind of an interesting interesting play. I mean, you just never know when he's going to show up. But uh, I do like Reed. I know, Steve, you mentioned Reed. I mean, I think that's the guy I'd get on in the 9Ks. If I was going for, for more tournaments, uh, I, I, he might be more popular than I think this week. But uh, uh, I do like Casey at 88 too. But um, in that range, I feel like, you know, Reed is probably, for me, the strongest play. Um, I, I, I always... I always come back to Bubba, though, just because he's got the potential to, to sort of top five anywhere. So uh, is there one guy that sticks out there? I know Casey's approach to green stats, uh, strokes gained approaching the green are really strong. I know that's something you guys were tweeting out today or this week, too. Yeah, we haven't uh, we haven't posted anything, but we have, the uh, you know, a good amount of the, that, that data. We're kind of just, like, skimming through mm-hmm. uh, some of the regression, it's not really in a form to, to distribute, but we do have it. So within a week or so, we'll probably be a little more formal. But yeah, I mean, it's it's you know it's looking like uh, just to give you an example, when we run our regressions on the key stats, uh, we generally will look at a bunch of different factors. And one of the main things we used to do, or we still we still do, is we run the regression on say all of the the statistics that would make up strokes gained tee to green. So normally we would do. You know, driving distance, driving accuracy, proximity, and scrambling proximity, the four things that get you to the green. Right. Which makes it's not perfect. It usually, you know, you can usually explain anywhere from 40 to 60% of the variation in strokes gained T to green with the core alone, which is okay. But with uh, with this coming out, we ran the same types of numbers, and we did it with, you know, the around the green, the approach, and the off the tee, and it was able to account for oh, about 88% of the variation, obviously, uh, 88 to 92%. And I think... Uh, what was incredible was the uh, the strokes gained approach was just about uh, a tad more relevant than strokes gained putting, and it's rare that you know any one individual part uh, will, will overtake it, other than strokes gained to degree in, in total. So I was really surprised by that and how much it jumped off the page, and I think a lot of people recognize that as well. Yeah, that, no, that's cool. That's uh, that's really interesting to hear. Yeah, I mean, I think it's awesome that they finally they're starting to break it down more with strokes gained. So I'm sure that'll help you guys with, with the stats and stuff for sure. But, uh, yeah, to get back to the field, um, I, I know Casey, uh, he shot 66, 60 here, six here to open in 2014. So uh, with strong tee, tee to green at the players too. So, again, uh, just someone else to think about um, when you're making lineups. Uh, I, I, think, I, I don't think he's going to be high owned or anything. Um, uh, th- the price, uh, there's just so much good value under him um, that uh, I, I think people will probably just ignore him. So, uh, it's definitely someone I like uh, this week, but um, there's definitely a lot of value in this range. I think a lot of people will be on Duffner. Just the consistency. Uh, I, I think Chris Kirk is in a really good spot here. Um, just again, another player ranks highly in, in approach uh, approaching the green. He's 24th in strokes gained approaching the green. Uh, strokes gained tee to green. He was strong last week. He just hasn't got the putter going. If Chris Kirk starts putting, he's going to start uh, top five. He's probably going to win a tournament. Uh, he just it, you just don't know when. He can definitely get hot enough to do it, but. Uh, and Chris Kirk is basically one hot putting week away from winning a tournament. I can get behind you there. Uh, definitely like Kirk this week. I mean, I've been liking Kirk since he's kind of finally got himself back into form. Um, you know, back just going back to this range, you know, I'm not going to really be too concerned with his ownership this week because I just I think this week is another Patrick Reed week for me. So yeah. he's, he's probably going to be my most overweight player again for the second week in a row. You know, at um. At Nicholas Designs, you know, he's it's, he's pretty forgiving off the tee box, and then uh, as you get closer to the hole, it gets a lot more challenging. I actually played a very tough Nicholas Design a few weeks back in Mexico, mm-hmm. and I could I could attest to that directly. I, I'm <laughs> I'm more of like the uh, quote unquote bomber type that sprays it all over off the tee box, and uh, so the course definitely fit me in that perspective. But the, as you got close to the greens, if you can't, not only the undulation is pretty good, but the just the tight lies around the greens and how how difficult it is to get up and down. And uh, you know Patrick Reed's best, one of the best in the world that is scrambling, and, and and you know he's finally over the last like three or four weeks finally getting his putting back to uh, where it should be and where where he historically ranks. And I was re- believe last year he led the field at um, Muirfield in strokes game putting as well. So um, you know he's still stroking the ball, tops on tour amongst the best. And uh, the, the the premium I'm going to put on scrambling. I'm uh, definitely uh, all in on uh, Patrick Reed this week too at the in this range. Yeah, I mean, uh, Reed obviously the guy that we've been kind of keying in on since 
just before the, the players, and it's been one of those things, kind of like what you're saying about Kirk, uh, Jeff, you know, just, just to get that putting going. He got it going a little better the last week, and, you know, it seems like he's starting to find uh, the type of form you'd expect from a guy that, you know, that's won a few times. Um, another guy that, you know, I kind of already mentioned, but I, I just, I'm, I'm really excited about, really excited about Schwartzel. I, I mentioned him already, but, you know, I've been kind of tracking him all year, and it's just, he's, he seems to be underpriced every single where I look. I mean, you know, I bet him at eight at eight thousand. I mean, he's he's averaging seven points more than someone priced at eight thousand. His strokes gained. He's second in the field um, in strokes gained uh, over the last twelve weeks. The only person better than him is Patrick Reed. Um, you know, they're both putting average now. I mean, I have them, uh, you know, a hundred and second on. Uh, on tour in the last 12 weeks, and strokes they're putting at 106 for Reed and Schwartzel, so they're both you know kind of right up there. They're both birdieing two to three percent more. I mean, you know, they're both comparable guys. I think you're obviously getting a, a better price at Schwartzel, but you know, I look at those two as kind of in the same area in terms of overall pedigree, type of game, you know, ball striking. I I like both of them. I, I just I, I love the price on Schwartzel. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, like I said, there's a lot of value in this field, and I mean that's Schwartzel's like the if he's not the best value, he's one of the biggest ones for sure. I mean, I don't know why his price went down by a thousand this week. I mean, he made the cut the last couple of weeks, so um, and he's T25 last week. I mean, it, he didn't even play that bad, so it's it's really kind of interesting. It's it's kind of strange to be honest, but um, yeah, his price went down. He's under. He's the same price as Gary Woodland. He's less than Justin Thomas, less than Kevin Kisner. Like it, it makes no sense, but uh, that's that's his price. I mean, so you got to take advantage of it. He's got a good record at this course too, so um, he'll probably you know, be and a little. He, sh- and, he, and he fits that Kirk narrative as well too. His yeah, last, exactly. His yeah. last two events, he's had negative two point nine, negative point seven five stroke gain putting, and specifically at Dean and DeLuca, he finished top twenty five, and that comes on the heels of a negative four point two eight stroke gain putting on Sunday, which obviously uh, brought him back into a less yeah. overwhelming finish. But you know what? If he uh, gets a couple of those. 10 to 15 footers to start falling for birdie because he's given himself a lot of great looks at those, then he could easily jump to the top of the leaderboard. And, and the one himself. thing I'll say, one thing I'll say about Schwartzel is I, I would much rather, like if we're like betting on which of these three guys are going to get the putter going, I'd say Reed or Kirk, or I'd put way more money on Reed or Kirk over Schwartzel because Schwartzel right. has struggled with his putter a lot over his career. He, he, he seemed to get it figured out at the start of the season and then it's kind of gone cold again, so, uh, you know, obviously he can still do it. And, I mean, like, if he's so good at tee to green that he doesn't even really need to putt that well to, to do well. So, I, I mean, value-wise, he's, he's the best. But uh, talent-wise, on the greens, he's probably the worst. So that's that's the only thing I'd say about him. But, yeah, he's still a fantastic value. I mean, I'm not trying to put anyone off him because he really no, is. No, so. I'd agree. If we're, we're going to say between those three, who has shown a tendency to just get hot with a putter, it's the other two. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You know, another uh, another guy in that kind of range that I I hadn't keyed in on, and I'm um he's one of the guys in our uh, our data that that are in the top 30 of all six of the key stats which we put out this week, which are tee to green, strokes near putting, par five scoring, birdie or better, prox 175 to 200, and then overall prox because we kind of over overweighed proximity this week because of what we found in those proximity. Uh, strokes gain numbers, yeah. but uh, obviously I think you'd expect it to be Hideki Matsuyama, but the guy that I'm keying in on here, uh, Russell Knox is in the top, uh, top 30 of all six of those categories in the field, and you know he's not a guy that I've been on the last couple of times people are saying, hey, what about Russell Knox, but when I see that, it's always something that draws my attention each week, so uh, I'm going to do a little more diving in there. I just found it now when I was kind of looking through the numbers, so I don't have much else to say on, on the form, but yeah. it's somewhat you know, I love Russell Knox this week, man. Like, I, I think this course is amazing for him. I, again, just a guy who the price is just like making me drool. I mean, he's he's going to be in every, probably most of my lineups. Uh, and and, and I, I love the spot too because people think about oh, he, you know, he he bombed at the players and and he missed the cut last week. Well, he just about won the Irish Open. He played pretty much amazing there for the last three rounds. Uh, I don't really care about the players because I mean, it basically came down to one hole, which is. You know, the 17th is just like a, I don't want to call it like a, a joke hole, but it, it kind of is. I mean, it's built to make players look bad. And then three tournaments ago, he just about won at the RBC Heritage. So uh, on top of that, 
like you said, uh, I think you're bang on with the proximity and stuff like that. These greens, they have small green complexes here. We've seen accurate players do well here before. I think it's a big day. I, I love Russell Knox this week. I think he's, uh, again, just one of those those good values you can key in on. Yeah, pair of top twos in his last four worldwide on top of that. And I think I believe he's uh, first in green regulation this year, too, on tour. I'm not sure exactly uh, what his R data is. I'll have to look that up. But, yeah, it's hard not to like Knox coming into this week. <clears throat> so um, let's see. Uh, there's who else in that range? So I mean, we got Mark Leishman, who we we obviously we know and love, and uh, I mean he's he's been playing pretty good too. I mean uh, he definitely showed up last week pretty pretty nicely. Uh, four rounds under in the 60s. I didn't necessarily look at his stats too much, but he, he did seem to play a little bit better uh, last week. So uh, the approach stats on him aren't as good. He did play really well here at this tournament last year. So. The one thing I'd say about Leishman is he's really, really good, really talented around the greens. So um, I'm not too shocked. Like he, he can definitely handle himself on these, these green complexes. Another guy who's got like a top finish at Augusta too. So uh, don't be shocked if he pops up again with a nice week. Uh, we know we know we love Mark Leishman. Yeah, I, I'm gonna just ditto exactly what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, it's where we get surprised by Mark Leishman because uh, we're always on him. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'll, I'll, have, I'll have a piece of margulation in this league. There's no, there's no doubt. Um, is there anyone else in the in the high seven Ks that you really keying in on? Like, the, for me, the, you know, I like Daniel Berger. I just don't really like him this week. Kind of the same with with Byung-Han An. Uh, I just feel like this course is it's a little in bit tricky. Our, Maybe I'm giving the course too much credit. I don't know. In our ranks, Berger is by far the the highest. Ranked guy under 8,000. He's yeah. uh, he's the top guy in our second class, right, literally right above, and this is in order: Patrick Reed, Chris Kirk, and Charles Horchel. I think the three of us here could make a case for those three over Berger. But again, I always kind of bring up each week that kind of objective uh, nature yeah. of the model that I like. Um, so he throws, you know, he gets thrown in there. Um, the only people above him are Matsuyama, Day, Speed, Kutcher, McElroy, Johnson. So yeah, uh, there's that. Uh, you know, I mean, listen, the, the course history is eh, considering he's, he's 0 for 1, so you can't really say much, but everything else is actually stacking up. I mean, the round-by-round round numbers look really strong. Um, after that, you know, middle of our second class is Francesco Molinari. He's the next guy uh, in the sevens that that, uh, that the model's at least spitting out. I mean, he's got one really strong finish here, um, decent form. The key stats are there. So those are the two guys, you know, model-wise that are, are showing up in the mid-upper sevens for us. Yeah, I like Berger too. I th- like this is purely a form play for me. I think he's eight for his last eight, and of his last five, I believe he has uh, three top tens and nothing outside the top twenty. So you know what? I'll uh, I'll ride that into Ohio this week. Yeah, no, I, and I'm not shocked at all to hear Daniel Berger showing up that high. I mean, like like you said, eight straight cuts, and it's not just eight straight cuts. It's like eight straight top twenties. Like he's absolutely like smashing the ball. I mean, he is he's playing really well. So. Um, one thing that does scare me though is, like, like I said, just the guys that are that, that are priced around him. You know, he pops up the most out of uh, out of most of those guys. So, you know, you might be uh, getting him at, at higher ownership levels than some of those other guys yeah. around him, like like a Knox or maybe possibly a Leishman. So that's something to keep in mind too. Yeah, no, and, and I think for GPPs, like I said, I, I do think there's comparable plays. I mean, I think Leishman's pretty a uh, pretty good swerve play there. He'll definitely be lower owned. So mm-hmm. uh, for GPPs, think definitely something to consider. But um, it, yeah, I don't know. Like I said, the course is tricky this week. So um, don't be shocked if some of these guys like I'm not going to be huge on on some of these younger players like uh, like Berger myself. That's just mm-hmm. my personal feeling, but. Uh, at the same time, if, if Berger finishes like T5 or like something crazy again, I, I won't be that shocked either. So because he's playing really well. Um, so yeah, I guess like mid 7K range. I mean, you got Chapel there. I mean, another guy who's like top 10 strokes gain T to green. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what to do with Kevin Chapel. He's such a bad putter. So I, that's part of the problem with me. That, but uh, that's probably what's going to scare me off from this week. Yeah, I think so too. I definitely like Molinari. I mean, I think that's another. Like, there's, there's like five guys I picked out who I just popped off as huge value. Molinari was the other one. I'm not shocked to hear he's he's he popped up for you guys uh, statistically either because he's T to green. He's been really really good this last little bit. Uh, almost as good as Berger. Uh, 
results-wise, too. Yeah, I think uh, another guy, just, sorry, just reading through the, uh, the chat there, yeah, um, no asking about Danny Lee. I mean, he was a guy that we had in our cash lineup that, you know, we actually had a really successful week with. But uh, this week, I mean, you know, two missed cuts here. Not not too strong uh, on the course histories. So that that hurts him a little bit from from my eyes. I, I don't I, I don't like I really like taking someone that hasn't made a cut in more in, in multiple tries. But you know obviously that's not going to turn you 100 percent off, and he's still you know playing well overall. So Danny Lee, I mean six to eight cuts. The the recent form of key stature there, just you know at 7500. Like I said, I, I'd actually I feel like you're going to get more ownership value out of Chapel. Even if the, the putting isn't there, but you know, obviously, like you said, Molinari and, and up to Berger, um, I, I like those guys just in terms of ability more than Danny Lee right now. Yeah, I'm with you there. Um, you know, Danny Lee's been pretty good too, but uh, I agree. Like, uh, I, I think when it all said and done, I'll uh, I'd probably get on uh, Molinari before before him. Kyle Rifers is kind of interesting too. He um, I think he switched clubs or something, um, and uh, like right before the the Byron Nelson. So it's kind of interesting. It's a bit of a bit of a narrative, but uh, obviously it might have helped them in a, a bit of a way. He's a good ball striker, anyways. Some uh, a lot of weeks, but uh, yeah, I mean uh, his last eight rounds, worst he shot is 70. So and uh, last week was a par 70. So it's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and like Bobby saying, Lee's Lee's just not putting well. It's, just, it's it's tremendous to me to see with with the kind of research we've been doing and the research that's been out there, how much, how good some of these guys are at striking the ball and not putting. You know, in yeah. my mind growing up, I mean, I, I've always thought that these guys just putt so well and that, that's, and they, all, of them, all of them are incredible putters and you know, as I've found, as I've gotten older, is I can strike the ball pretty damn well myself and I can't really putt either. These, I mean, it's so hard to make putts consistently, especially on these types of greens. It's, I'm less and less surprised the more I look at the data that some of the, some of these guys can't putt. It's incredible. Yeah, no, it's you're exactly right, and that's that's kind of why um, when we're talking about Kirk and Schwartzel, it's I know I've seen Kirk do it. I've seen Kirk get like red hot, and I've seen Patrick Reed get get hot. And Patrick Reed was like a really a putter last year, so I know they can turn it around. Um, some of these guys though are just historically like Kevin Chapel is never going to be a good putter. He might putt well enough one week to win. But he's never going to be like a great putter. Same with Molinari, really. I mean, he's 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 okay, but he's he's generally, you know, sucks with that club too. So it's um, you get excited about the way these guys are hitting the ball, but like, man, yeah, some of them just cannot sink a putt because if they did, they'd be they'd be winning uh, a lot more than they do. But um, at the same time, you know, you want guys obviously who were good tee to green because. Like you said, I mean, they when they do turn around and they do start taking putts, that'll be the week they, they finish T5 or something, or better. So one guy at uh, 7,100 I got to mention is Thorbjorn Olsen. So I like Thorbjorn. I like playing him on the European Tour, but um, he was T, he was like a top 10 here the one time he played here. He's, he um, tends to really play like par 5 as well and stuff like that too. Uh, coming in in good form. I know he missed the, the cut at the BMW Championship, but he hates that course. I think he's missed, like, six cuts in a row there. So um, definitely a guy I'm going to use in GPPs this week. Um, I, I really like the short par fives for him. like the fact he's played here before, did well. So uh, I, I just wanted to throw him out there if you, if you guys had any thoughts on him. There's nothing I don't like about him except that I have to manually switch his o, the O's in his name every week when I'm tracking the European <laughs> data. So besides that, I might not have as much exposure as I would like to be. I'm just generally bitter for it. Yeah. <laughs> no, but we, no, I think, I, I, like you said, I like the fact that he does have course experience this week. He's been playing well um, over in Europe. And, uh, you know, at, at 7,100, you know, that's, I think that's great value for, for a guy of his pedigree. So. Uh, yeah. I, I, I can definitely get behind um, owning some shares of uh, Thor Bjorn this week. So I just, um, real quick, sorry, because I was just following along in the chat there, Bobby. I just posted a picture that I had tweeted. I was talking back and forth with Pat Mayo. Um, this is what the numbers look like for the winners, uh, like nine of the last ten years. Right. And just that, what I wanted to make clear, there's only two of the years, I guess a three out three of them, but only two of them did someone really run away with, with putting. Uh, and those are two years that they weren't approach, you know, getting the job done with the approach. I mean, um, 
obviously because of the nature of putting, the ability to, to, to gain more exists because if you make a 40 footer, it's, you know, you're gaining a, a ton compared to someone who hits a 10 feet or 20 feet. So I, you will see a little more there, but you can kind of tell the only time that approach wasn't, you know, above average for the field in, in stroke gain was when they were able to save it with putting. So I think it's kind of interesting to look at that. I mean, you look at the tee to green numbers, you know, they're, pr they're pretty ridiculous. I mean, only, only twice the strokes gained for a winner get to double digits, and that's just at 10, but it's pretty yeah. much double digits for most of the weeks that uh, were won with, with, with tee to green only. So and around the yeah. green, you know, not too many strokes are getting gained around the green. Um, I, know, I know when I was looking at some guys' tee to green stats this week, uh, like in past champions, I think it was eight of the last nine were ranked like 15th or higher for their year end, the year they won. So only Lingworth, Lingworth was like 57th or something. Everyone else was like 15th or better. So, like, yeah, it, it, Tita Green, yeah, I, I'm not shocked to see these stats, like, yeah, for the week that they won and stuff. That's, yeah, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, think, I think it's ranked, I, I, you know, I probably should have put the year, but I think it's most recent on the top. So I think it's... Yeah, yeah. that's got to be Lingworth on the top. Like, I, 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 I'm almost positive that's Lingworth on the top, yeah. yeah. The rest of them are at least eight or above, you know. Because Lingworth putted so well last week, last year, I remember when, because I watched his tournament. Because his Lingworth's putt that he made, uh, I think it was on the first playoff hole, cost me 13 grand. So I remember that, I remember that putt very clearly. Wow, <laughs> did not know that. <laughs> yeah, I was in uh, I was in first place in the in the the six k man field, and uh, if Rose had won, I would have stuck. But uh, Lingworth won, I dropped a third, so it cost me 13k. Oh man. <laughs> yeah, so I'm out for revenge this year. I, I can see you on that one, dude. That's that's cool. <laughs> it wasn't like a it was like a fifteen foot like swerving putt. Like before he hit it, the commentators were like, Oh, this is like this probably isn't go this isn't going in. Like he has no chance. And then you saw it and it broke like five feet at the hole and it fucking went in. But anyways. <laughs> and that was like a that was like a Greenbrier last year for me. I had Kisner and Streb in the uh, final and I just need one of those two three to win, I would have taken on like twenty five K and of course, uh, our boy Danny Lee, who can't put worth a shit right now. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's about as bad. Playoffs suck. God, I, I hate playoffs. Anyways. Bob, what was that? Uh, sorry, uh, go ahead. Was it not a year or so ago at the the British Open, uh, our buddy uh, Jamie? But yeah, if DJ Eagle the last hole, he won 100,000. Yeah. That's ridiculous, but it's like... It's an he hit out of bounds. And he only ended up winning like 2,500. Yeah, he hit out of bounds. And he, he wins like, yeah, like a grand or two. <laughs> it's tough at the top of those leaderboards at the end. Yeah, I know, I know. Like, it, it, it's so volatile. <laughs> oh, man. DJ screwed a lot of people in major championships last year. I mean, come on. <laughs> All right. So who are you guys liking under 7K? Is there is there, like, a favorite pump play on, under uh, in the 6K range or anything? Uh, yeah, I do want some just comment on the one. You know, he hasn't been playing that well, but you know who I think generally his game, at least towards the beginning of the year, that fits that that would fit this type of course and is definitely a back to the the price levels he was at the start of the year before he won and and finished in the top ten at the Masters is I kind of I'm I'm willing to take a chance on Smiley Coffin at 6,700 this year. I think I think he's 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 fit for uh for this Nicholas type design. He's um, generally pretty solid around the greens. I don't know how he's been that great lately. Probably not that great, but he, he could hit the ball very long. He doesn't have to really worry about the tight fairways kind of obstructing him. And um, at 6,700, I think that's a pretty good value for a guy that obviously has shown he could play well at Augusta and handle those greens. So uh, Smiley, I think, is worth, uh, worth, worth taking a couple flyers on at that 6,700 price. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, the short par fives are in his wheelhouse too. So, um, like you said, I mean, he just needs to get it out there on the tee, and he'll get it out there at least 300 yards. So, um, yeah, he, he could definitely score. Um, you know, yeah, he has been a bad one. He's missed a couple cuts in a row, but um, we know he's we know he's a good young player. He's probably not going to go in some deep slump here. So, uh, you're probably getting a depressed price on him. I mean, it probably won't last too long. Um, I'm not shocked he, he kind of didn't play well at the at the Colonial, to be honest. Not really a course I'd ever expect Smiley Coffin to uh, 
to go well at. So uh, this is this is a week I'd look for him to turn around too. Uh, I, I agree. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll throw Sean O'Hare out there too. I mean, just another week where he basically you know top twenty in strokes gained tee degree and like bottom ten in like strokes gained putting. So guys hitting it like three ten every time he hits it off the tee. So another guy who could can get it out there, uh, take advantage of the par fives. And he's got some good results uh, from back back in the day, from back when he was ranked like top 20 in the world. So uh, he was sixth or 12th year, one couple years. So uh, look out for Sean O'Hare too. I like him. I like him at 6,800. And actually, like honestly, O'Hare and, and Coffin are the two guys uh, I, I had from that range, specifically for GPPs. Uh, I think they have either one of them could pop up with like a top top 12, top 10 in, in my mind here. So. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't, Sorry, even, I wouldn't be per, uh, pushed away from rolling O'Hare out in some cash games as well. I mean, yeah, interesting. Yeah. For for he's making he's, he's four for his last four. Um, like he's getting the job done. Tee to green. His putting hasn't been there, but you know, at this price, you, you probably uh, this is probably not to maybe decide to earn. And you know, I'm not in love with earn, but in terms of consistency, those two guys uh, are, are decent cash plays for the sub seven K range, in my opinion. Yeah, no, definitely. Bobby, what's up? Seeing her in there? Yeah, I was I was looking at him earlier. I think he's he's got he's got a relatively good uh, course history here. I believe he might have missed the cut last year, and I think he's three of his last four with uh, some decent finishes uh, over the last like eight or so weeks. Yeah, that's definitely that, that's one of the two guys I was going to comment. I mean, if you look at his his strokes gained tee to green, you know he's been significantly positive over the last uh, you know. 12 weeks. I mean, he had one one really uh, ugly strokes gained at uh, Wells Fargo, which I think is where you and I played him in cash. Uh, <laughs> but um, other than that, yeah, I mean, he he's looking really strong. I mean, I'm, I know you never get on the Summer Haze train, but I, I like him, you know, probably more for for cash um, as well. I just, you know, he's he's kind of gotten back to a point where he's consistently making the cut and. You know, anytime you get guys making the cut at that price point, you know you can you can stuff them in a lineup. I think. Yeah, I, I'm definitely with you on Hearn for cash. I, th- I think cause even though I like o- I, I love O'Hare, but uh, I think I'd actually lean Hearn and cash for me personally. I think just the course layout. Uh, I know he does have a good, pretty good history here too. He's a really and he's super accurate. He's kind of like a like a poor man's version of Russell Knox or kind of thing. Um, and his putters, his putters improved as the years gone on. He had to switch from the long putter last year, so mm-hmm. it's improved. And he actually, kind of interesting, he did actually use a short putter at one point in his career, so I don't think the transition's been as bad for him as uh, some other guys. So, yeah, no, I, I definitely like her uh, as a player for, for fantasy. I mean, anytime he's this cheap, he's, he's a good play. Yeah, and just to give you the, the data, the numbers, he's... You no, know, he missed a cut last year, but the three prior years he had a T25, T21, and T28. So all he's yeah. like top 30. And in his last five, he's made four or five cuts, and all four have gone T28 or lower. So yeah, I yeah. definitely get behind him in cash at that play. There's actually a few other guys. Like I mean, McGirt's down there at 6,500. You could even think about, I think, but uh, I'd probably prefer Hearn over him. Uh, I I just like the form. There's a, actually the other guy I kind of interest who popped up a little bit last week is uh, Ben Martin, T29, uh, three, four pretty solid rounds. So doesn't have the history here. I think he's made like one or two cuts, but um, pretty quality player for 6,200. Um, I don't know if you need to dip down that low in cash games, but uh, definitely the name that sticks out for me uh, under under 6,500. I just think the upside's there with Martin. So uh, anyone sticking out specifically um, in your guys' head? You can have some Bowditch exposure. <laughs> um, sure <laughs> he P22 last week. I shouldn't even be joking about it. He played really well. I'm not sure I'm back on the, uh, the Bowditch train yet, but uh, let's see. We got a real. Uh... What are you guys' thoughts on DL3? <laughs> um, I know he's kind of fallen off the last couple of events he's played in, but his sports history is. I mean, he definitely got experience. He's got P5 and, and a couple of top 20s as well. Uh, I mean, you're really uh, scraping the bottom of the floor right now, but. Uh, I mean, the price is good. He's been averaging, you know, more than that. Well, than where he's priced at, pretty significantly. I mean, he's ranked 36th in our uh, in our P gap, so you know there's definitely a value there. I mean, the key 
it's not so much the recent form that hurts, but the, the key stats are actually even worse. I mean, he's, he's bottom of the barrel in terms of key stats. Yeah. Most of those stats are that we're using this week, obviously, as you know, Bobby, are, are centered around ball striking. So um, that's my only concern there. I mean, I think the price is right. So again, at that price, if you sneak him through the cut, especially you know in GPP, still you know, you know he's going to be under five percent owned. So if he gets through the cut, then yeah, you know you really stole something there. Um, so I can definitely say that. I mean, I know one of the guys is asking about Siwoo Kim. I'm not sure if you guys touched on that. I'm not just reading through there though. Uh, oh yeah, Siwoo. So uh, what's he at this week? He's at like yeah, 6,400, but he was yeah. up from 5,800. So. You know, I, don't, I don't really know if there's much to warrant the the jump in price, which is, I think, what they were commenting on. But uh, it does bring uh, his P gap to negative, which, I, you know, last week it was a few points positive. So uh, it definitely, it, it's, a, it's it's close enough to that price. I, you know, he should be an upper five, lower six player for, uh, yeah. for, for asking about that. I don't hate him, to be honest. Like, I mean, uh, I think once you get under 6,500 this week, like I said, I do like Ben Martin. He's probably my favorite uh, sort of value-ish guy down in that range. But uh, I, I definitely consider Siwoo Kim because there's not there's not a ton. Of, you know, Camilo Vijegas has a really good course history here. So it's one of those courses Camilo tends to show up at. So he's made a, he's made like almost every cut here. Um, that's probably another guy I'd, I'd throw out, but uh, other than maybe you know um, Camilo, Ben Martin, uh, I'd probably roll with Siwoo Kim just you know from a talent perspective over a lot of these guys. To be honest, I know he doesn't have any course history, but uh, and I don't really like the price jump. Like I'd rather he was 6,200 or 61. But um, yeah, I mean I'm looking at some of these guys in pretty poor form. I, I'd, I'd probably rather trust Siwoo Kim to maybe you know pop up with another top 25 or something like that. So. What about uh, the Swafficer, Hudson Swafford? I think that's the guy I might target in on at, uh, at 5,800. Um, what did you call the Swafficer? The Swafficer. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, at 5,800, decent price there for him. He's got one start here. It was a pretty solid start. Um, you know, the key stats, of course, this year are the two better parts of the game. The form has been average, but again, at 5,800, you're not going to expect someone to be in incredible form. So the fact that the key stats are up there uh, in the top, you know, almost top third of a uh, stacked field, that that's definitely intriguing. Yeah, and I mean, he, I think he, I don't know, let me get my course sheet in front of me here. I want to say he had a, like one decent finish here, but uh, I might be wrong about that. I don't want to. Offered, I, I, I can tell you right now. Oh, one made cut. Okay, and it was only 63. So, okay. Well, I mean, that, anyways. It, because he has made his last three cuts, so. Yeah, he's, he's made his last three cuts. I mean, he can just bomb it off the tee here. For, for, for a big big guy, he's actually not that bad around the greens, too. Like, uh, he, he can kind of putt. Uh, he's, he just seems to make, like, really dumb mistakes every once in a while. Like, he's like a poor man's Dustin Johnson. But, uh, yeah, I could, I could see him getting it going on, on these par fives anyways. So I just think for 5,800, I'd, I'd go with his, his upside a little bit over – over love or, or anyone else. Uh, I thought he might crack 6K this week just because of the made cuts, but uh, he didn't. So Jason Bone actually played okay last week too. I mean, th- with Bone, it's it's just a case of do you want to risk getting on him before he gets before he's like back in real form, or or is he just is this the way he's going to play the rest of the year? So I mean, another guy you could think about at 5900. The date and I just like kind of looked at us uh, scrolling through the prices on DraftKings. He definitely was the guy that stood out the most to me down there. Yeah. Thinking about where he was at certain points during last season, and now we're looking at him at 5900, just kind of throws the shot. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's kind of nuts, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, so, I mean, definitely have, uh, you know, um, Swafford and um, and Bone to think about. KJ Choi is another guy who's made a ton of cuts here at this event, past winner. Uh, someone I, I feel like people might throw out, uh, might get, a, you know, a few percent owner, higher ownership. I don't think he'll be chalky or anything, but uh, someone else you can think about if you need to make cut at 6K. I mean, he's I think he's made the cut in, like, 11 of 12 Appearances here, so um, definitely keep KJ Choi in mind. 
Come on out, uh, out, out our, our match Strep. Strep, yeah. Oh, man, Streb. Streb, Streb, Streb. Yeah, keep, waiting. keep waiting for him to come come back, but he's been putting brutally this year. Yeah. He's a guy that had a pretty significant split between Bermuda and Bent, uh, favorable to Bermuda, and yeah. it just doesn't matter where it is this year, to be honest. Yeah, yeah, he's putting really bad. Like, I know he was. I know I was checking his putting stats out earlier in the year, and they were bad. But they haven't. He haven't. He hasn't improved. So, um, I, I'm just gonna stay off him. Like I said, I, I, I'd rather get on Ben Martin, who showed up last week. Pretty good all around game. I think. I think this course suits him a little better, anyways. So, um, yeah, Streb is uh, ranked 272nd on tour in strokes game putting over the last 12 weeks. Yeah, that doesn't shock me at all. Like he's been <laughs> brutal. Yeah. That's that's like hopefully, hopefully his course history attracts some people down to him at that price. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, th- that's kind of where I'm at with him. I hope people do get on him because I yeah, no, that's brutal. Holy, I didn't know it was that bad. But uh, Ricky Barnes thoughts on Barnes. Um, <laughs> I-, I love my comment there. <laughs> what you say? I mean, yeah. You know, oh, <laughs> I like Ricky Barnes. I've always been a fan of the guy. I've always wanted him to do well. Ever since I was at the my first open was the U.S. Open at Bethpage, where he kind of like made a run with all those guys. And like, oh yeah. It's then like, you know, if you hit on it's, if you hit on Barnes, you know, you don't you don't try and double down. It's like the Steve it's like the Steve Marino call like I had a couple weeks ago. Like, don't, yeah. You know, Bobby and I had a lot of Barnes exposure early in the year when he was playing really well. And you know, I'm at Valero. I was on him at Valero too, except uh, I had such a shitty lineup that it didn't fucking matter. But anyways, <laughs> go ahead. I mean, you know, so that's kind of where I'm at. Like, he's that's not a guy that you're going to expect to play at that level over the course of the year. And, and you know, I, I, I like to think that when I've gotten a good run out of a guy like that. It doesn't make sense because obviously we're we're not in like the guessing business. We're in the analytics business, but that's just yeah. I, it's that personal you know hunch in me. Um, as for Rifers, uh, yeah, I loved Rifers last week. I haven't seen everything pop up this week, um, you know, as much. Let me see. That's, that's what they were asking about. Kyle Rifers at seventy four hundred. Um, yeah, I mean, he's, he's actually a little lower than he was last week for us, I and mean, he's nine of, nine of what, 11 cuts here I got, something like that. He, you know, he's making his cuts. It's only one of three here, but the recent form is strong. I mean, the price is phenomenal. You know, he's averaging 9.1 points more than someone priced at 7,400. So on the value alone there, you know, if you think he's going to keep, uh, you know, playing well, um, you know, you can't beat the price on... Uh, on Rutgers right now. Let me just confirm. I mean, how, how good of the finish has been? Yeah, I mean, obviously the fifth place last week, you know, coming off the tenth at Byron. I mean, for 7,400, you know, I feel like the way everyone was on Colt Nose because of, three, you know, two or three strong finishes, you know, maybe uh, Kyle Riper's going to back to back top tens. Feeling really good right now. Yeah, no, no, for sure. I mean, uh, I don't know what I mentioned, he, but he uh, he changed clubs, so um, seemed to really give him a boost, whatever whatever the change was. Uh, but uh, yeah, no four straight round or eight straight rounds of seventy or better, definitely something to take note of. I think people get on Ryan Moore here just because of course history. Are you guys gonna have any exposure? Or? I saw it. I don't know where he's gonna fit in. You know, I'll, I'll probably. If I do what I did last week, which was fun, I mean, I put out a bunch of those uh, GBPs, and you know, I put out before just getting into the cash and the satellites. You know, I, I had 40 GPP lineups, which is you know obviously not max, but it's more than I'm used to doing personally. I'm more of like a yeah. couple lineups and then just go with them. But I'll probably have one or two there. It was more fun for me to do it that way. I got to make a lot of interesting lineups and had some success. So uh, definitely, I, listen, you know me. Anyone with course history, I'll uh, I'll find uh, a way to get in one or two times if I'm putting that many lineups in. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean Moore's I, Moore's a guy who I, you don't expect him to struggle for too long. So he's not like a guy I, I think you need to avoid just off the basis of of a, of a, a tiny bad stretch. He's been off since the players too. So uh, I, I kind of expect him to bounce back sooner and later. So. Definitely likes this course. I mean, he's he's got an incredible record at this course. So, I could not be more off of more this week. Just to let you guys know. 
we're talking about ball striking, and um, you know his last three events. Um, he's got negative 11.09 strokes gain tee to green. He's got um, negative 0.45, negative 5.54. So you know I, that that just tells me that the guy does not feel comfortable sitting over the golf ball right now. And you know what? I'm not going to try to time Brian Morris market because I just don't think the ceiling is high enough like a Ricky Fowler's that I, I try to get back on Fowler this week. So I'm definitely probably gonna. You know, let the people who do love the course history jump on him, and uh, and I'll just hope that his tee to green data stays the same. Yeah, and then I mean, I, I think it would be different if he was like sixty six hundred, but he's seventy three hundred. Why don't we just pay up for Russell Knox? Like, yeah. it's, it, you know, it's yeah, you're right. It, it kind of makes no sense. Maybe what about your boy Luke? <laughs> Oh, I just realized I accidentally muted the mic there. Uh, no, I was just going into uh, my love affair on, uh, with Bill Haas, and someone asked about him, so I was just checking out. I mean, you know, Bill Haas has struck the ball well with his course. He has not putted particularly great. Um, but uh, since, you're, since you want to come, come after me with some Luke, obviously he played fairly well last uh, last week at Wentworth. You know, listen, if he was... Oh, Bobby. He's seven, seven cuts, course history, Luke Donald. That's what I just said. How about your boy Luke? That's that. You know, I didn't. I didn't notice that part of it. I, I, listen. That's the rule. I gotta have him. This. This. I mean, he's a hundred percent making the cut when he's a hundred percent making the cut. <laughs> you know, that, that's that's been the fact this year. If, if he plays a course where he hasn't missed the cut, at least in the last ten years, because um, that's where we're looking at for time frame. Uh, he's got four top thirties in his last six, and you know. It's, when there's a premium placed on short game and wide fairways, I feel like Donald fits it pretty well. You know, wow, 7,200. That's uh, that's interesting. I mean, you know, he hasn't scored w tremendous on the PGA Tour DraftKings points wise because of a couple of missed cuts, but you know, he's having a good year. Um, obviously, he played well at Wentworth, which uh, I don't know if you've seen his course history at Wentworth. It was uh, you know ridiculous. Um, it's just kind of what he does. He, he, I, I think Luke Donald is the ultimate horse for course. So, yeah, he is. He he plays well in like certain spots, definitely. Like even even if he's like playing bad, he plays well at certain courses. All right. Can I see the screen? Okay. So, is there anybody else that you uh, that jumped out to any of you guys? I'm glad. I'm, you know, I'm trying. I mean, now is a guy that I thought was interesting. Just looking at the R date. I mean, I think people were slowly trying to get on Nah, and they haven't. But you know, he's one of only uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine guys in the field that are in the top 30 of strokes gain, tee to green, and strokes gain putting. Um, you know, I have him ranked uh, 12th in the field over the last 12 weeks in strokes gained tee to green, 38th, uh, you know, in strokes gained putting. Um, actually, that's not in the field; that's against the tour. Uh, so, you know, those numbers are good. And the one thing he's ranking fairly high in is he's in that top category for 175 to 200 yardage uh, proximity, which is the, the the yardage that popped up for us the most in terms of being important in proximity. So. I think Kevin Na is an interesting guy. I mean, I, the only thing is, I feel like everyone owns Kevin Na every week, so <laughs> that's my concern. But uh, I'm finally. He's, he's another guy who's always got some ownership. I mean, regardless of what he's playing, I don't know why people are so like hot with Kevin Na for DFS, but he's he's just always owned. I mean, I don't know why. It's not like he's, he gets like a ton of press coverage or something, but he's always there. Like he's always sort of like at least fifteen percent. I feel like the last couple of weeks people have tried to be ahead of the curve on him, and I think right now is probably the time that he's going to be on the on the you know the curve right there. I mean, if you look at his yeah. uh, you know his course history, he's four or five cuts here, averaging 63.3 drafting points, and that's 25th in the field and, and ranked for that. He's one of only a couple of players out of the top 30 in form key stats and course history. He's ninth in the field in key stats. You know, he's stroking the ball extremely well. So uh, 8100, yeah. I think it's a pretty strong value. Definitely. 
I know I was on him last week, but um, I, I think this week suits him just as well. Definitely, Definitely. just about one that was a couple of years ago. So. Yeah, I think I just don't mind the uh, I don't mind the the ownership possibility this week as I have last week. But the, the, the form mm-hmm. has been. It's not like it's not like he just all of a sudden started striking the ball well. He's he's been striking it. It's just he hasn't put together the the full four rounds. So I think you know it's been leading up to that point though. Yeah, he's he's down in a few stats like around the green. I know like last year he was like first in sand saves. Now he's like 90, I think. His scrambling numbers are down a bit, but that's just that's probably something you can tidy up, uh, especially after course you know, ball like this one. So. Um, I don't know. Is there any more questions, guys, or anything else you want to talk about? Or yeah, I mean, what uh. What else we got on there? I mean, it, it's kind of it, it's it seems a little less interesting when the field gets so good and it's not a major. It's like, I mean, you can kind of go on and on about all a lot of these players being strong players, and, and you can play. I feel like there's so many more combinations you feel comfortable about this week than you do in another week. I mean, I, I like that DraftKings has put out. You know, they have that four dollar contest for the hundred thousand dollars first place. I mean, yeah, it's one hundred and fifty thousand people, but um, you know, I mean. I'll throw four dollars at a hundred thousand any day, you know. Yeah. So I'm I'm kind of excited about that that prospect just to, just to get more excitement into it. I mean, I haven't looked at much for the Euro. Um, obviously, a much much smaller field than last week. I think that was probably a smart week for them to launch it. Um, with Absolutely. Their, yeah. The Masters. I mean, there's only like four or five guys in the field that had PGA Tour experience over the last three months. Um, you know, Henrik Stenson is the top price guy there. He doesn't have any Euro Tour experience in the last 12 weeks. So, uh, I mean, let's count the WGC. Yeah, no, the, the, Euro, the Euro field's way, way, way uh, weaker this week. I mean, you're going to have to kind of get on, like, real Euro sort of, sort of grinders and stuff like that and do, do a little more research. I know Lee Westwood's there. He's playing really well. He won at that course... Uh, like three or four years ago too. So interested to see how he plays. I wouldn't be shocked if he actually takes that tournament down. But uh, hey, he's, played, he's played well on uh, on the European Tour with the last two weeks. It's, that's his only yeah. weeks. Um, that was the one thing that showed up in, in some of the numbers we were able to put together. But uh, yeah, other than that, it's like you know, who you really who you throwing darts at? Yeah, yeah, no, for sure. It's uh, I, I know I did a bit of research on it uh, earlier, I think yesterday. But uh, yeah, it's it's gonna be more wide open. It's I like the Euro Tour because whenever you get, if you're ever like betting on it or something, and it's like Sunday, just lay, just don't bet on the leaders, just because it's going to be someone like five back. <laughs> they crumble, and then like someone you didn't even know was like in the field ends up winning, like eagling their last two holes or something. So I like it from that perspective because there's always it's it's inevitable meltdown on on Sunday. But uh, we saw it last week too. I mean, like you know, Chris Wood. You know, Westwood shot like 76. Scott Ham shot like 80. So, anyways, but uh, yeah, any more? Any? I don't know if there's any more things on the memorial, but uh, yeah, should be a good week. I mean, it, it's always good when there's like this many elite field players in the field. But uh, you're right; it's like still feel like we're just building up to the U.S. Open here. I can't complain about it. I mean, I'm excited. I'll be out there uh, out there in two weeks. I'm looking forward to it. Nice. All right. Have a good one then, guys. And uh, yeah. As usual, pleasure. Thank you, my man. Yeah. Hit us up at Jeff Fantasy Grind at FG Metrics. Hit us up. Any more questions? Obviously, we're on there on Twitter, and you know, hang out on the Slurp chat. We can always mention us here, and we can get back to you as well. Take care, guys. See ya. Thanks,